um, episode one, problem Iroha and agreed. Let's recap the statement. We asked to calculate the number of paths that go from upper left corner to lower right corner, only move down or right, and they do not visit this forbidden zone. On the picture you can see some good paths, green and blue. The yellow path is bad because it moves to the left here, and the pink path is bad because it visits the forbidden zone. Both sides are up to 100,000 and the sides of the forbidden zone are uh, up to the sides of the rectangle, so also big. Let's try to solve a simpler problem first. What if there is no forbidden zone? It's not strictly a subcase of our problem, because uh, in our problem the forbidden zone should be non-empty, but if it is of size 1, there is only one pass that goes through the forbidden zone, so the answer for this case would be just number of paths without forbidden zone minus 1, so we should be able to solve this problem. Uh, let's introduce coordinates. Uh, we start at coordinates 1, 1, and we finish at coordinates VH. Each move uh, to the right will increase x coordinate by 1, and each move down will increase y coordinate by 1. So there should be exactly uh, w minus 1 moves uh, to the right and exactly h minus 1 moves down. The order of the moves can be arbitrary, but the order of the moves uniquely defines the path. So to calculate the number of paths, we can instead calculate the number of orders of moves right and down, which can be imagined as a number of strings that can be arranged from exactly w-1 symbols r and h-1 uh, indies. This is a known problem and the answer to the problem is a binomial coefficient. If you don't know what a binomial coefficient is or you didn't know that that the answer to this problem, you should google binomial coefficients. Let's return to the original problem. How can we make sure that we don't visit the forbidden zone? Let's look at this horizontal line. Uh, any valid path, or like a, any path that goes only right or down, must intersect this line. It cannot intersect it here because it will enter the forbidden zone. So we have to make sure that it intersected here in the blue segment. Uh, here we can see uh, in orange two possible intersections. What if we fix the intersection, for example, fix this one intersection? Then uh, before the intersection we should move from the start to the beginning of the intersection and after the intersection we should move from the end point of the intersection to the end of uh, the whole path. And those halves are independent uh, and what's important uh, if we fix this position uh, the first part uh, of the path should be contained in this zone so it cannot go uh, in the forbidden zone and the second part will be contained to this zone so again it cannot go into the forbidden zone so to calculate the number of uh, paths we will iterate over the intersection and uh, uh, multiply the number of ways to choose the first half and the second half but those numbers are just number of paths that only go right or down uh, in grid without any limitations. So that's a binomial coefficient we discussed it earlier. 
since there are only linear number of possible intersections, uh, we just need to calculate linear number of binomial coefficients. How to do that? Well, uh, there is a formula for binomial coefficients. Uh, choose uh, k from n is n factorial divided by k factorial divided by n minus k factorial. We can pre-calculate factorials. Uh, and since we can calculate the inverse element model prime number in logarithmic time, uh, we can calculate the binomial coefficient as n factorial multiplied by inverse of k factorial by inverse of n minus k factorial. We can also pre-calculate inverses of factorials uh, and then we will be able to calculate binomial coefficients in constant time but then the pre-calculation is uh, an inverses which is n log mod. Can we get the, both of bo uh, the best of both worlds? Can we do pre-calculation in linear time and query in constant time? It turns out the answer is yes. There are two uh, kind of different methods. The first one is more general. Uh, we will just pre-calculate inverses for all small numbers, for all uh, numbers up to big N. Um, if we do that, calculation of inverse factorials is easy. You just do the same as for factorials, but multiply not by x, but by inverse of x each time. The algorithm to pre-calculate uh, inverses is not easy. Well, it, it's easy to write, but it's uh, smart. Uh, let's say that our modula is uh, p, and we can, uh, well, like, the inverse of 1 is just 1. So let's try to calculate the inverse for x, which is at least 2. And let's divide p by x with a reminder. That's like this. By definition, p is uh, p divided by x rounded down multiplied by x plus p model x. We can take this equation and write it modulo p uh, and we will move this summand to the left and change the order of parts. We will get this modulo equation. Uh, now x is inversible modulo p and p modulo x is also non-zero because p is prime uh, and thus it is also inversible modulo p. Let's take our equation and multiply it by inverse of x and inverse of p modulo x. On the left p modulo x and inverse of p modulo x will uh, kill each other we will get one here, so uh, only inverse of x will be left uh, on the left side. On the right side, uh, x and inverse of x will uh, kill each other and give one in the product. So on the right side, we will just get minus p divided by x floor multiplied by inverse of p model x. So to calculate the inverse of x, we want to calculate the inverse of p modulo x. Sounds like that was pointless, but actually that's not true because p modulo x is strictly less than x. So for it, the inverse is already calculated. So we do this kind of dynamic programming, multiple, uh, getting inverses for all the numbers from one to n in order using previously calculated values. That works in linear time in n. The second method, uh, it is specific for factorials. So let's look at the equation, which is basically the definition of the factorial, right? x factorial is x minus 1 factorial multiplied by x. But then we can uh, divide both sides by x factorial and x minus 1 factorial. So we will get x times uh, inverse of x factorial is equal to inverse of x minus 1 factorial. Um, 
So if we know the inverse of x factorial, we will be able to calculate the inverse of x minus 1 factorial. So we can go backwards in numbers. If we know the inverse of some big number factorial, we can from it go down to zero and calculate all the inverses, each one in constant time, because that's just multiplication by x. But how can we find that inverse factorial uh, that we want to start with? Well, we know how to calculate the inverse in log mod. So uh, we will pre-calculate factorials first, then calculate the inverse of the last one, and then go backwards and pre-calculate uh, inverses for all smaller factorials. Actually, using this, like after we do this, we can also get inverses for all numbers up to n uh, using this simple formula. But that's out of the scope. All right, we have solved the problem in linear time. Let's now talk about how we did that and how can we use the same ideas in the future. So uh, what we did is uh, we used this blue line to uh, split all the valid paths into groups by the intersection point. Uh, how did that help us? Well, it helped us because uh, each pass was in exactly one group and it was easy to calculate the size of each group because uh, we didn't care about the forbidden zone anymore. So the properties we are using is that uh, every valid pass must intersect our line, but it must intersect it exactly once. Um, and the second property is that we can easily calculate the number of ways to choose the first and second half uh, for every intersection point. So for example, if we would chosen like some horizontal line, it's still true that uh, each pass will intersect it exactly once, but it's not very helpful because uh, for the lower half, we can still go to the forbidden zone and well, we need to calculate the number of valid ways to choose the second half. And that sounds exactly like the problem we were trying to solve. So that deduction is not helpful. Uh, but for example, we can choose this green line or we can even like draw something harder, uh, something non that is not one straight line. But actually, it doesn't even have to be a line. Uh, it can be a set of cells. For example, this, sorry, this set of uh, purple cells uh, is great in the sense that uh, every valid pass should visit exactly one of those cells. And again, if we fix the cell, uh, then we cannot visit the forbidden zone, so it will be easy to calculate the number of uh, ways to choose the first half and the second half. In this particular problem, it doesn't matter uh, whether we are choosing like, the line we should intersect or the set of cells we should visit. But in uh, some problems, it might be easier to work with set of cells uh, because we don't have to worry about uh, those intersection step. We can just say, okay, for given cell, we leave it, uh, visit it, uh, and that just splits the path into two parts. But this orange set of cells is bad. And it, it is bad because it 
uh, doesn't satisfy uh, both these conditions. So first condition is not satisfied because, well, uh, each valid pass must visit an orange cell, but it can visit several of them like this. So if we just calculate the number of valid pass that passes through the given orange cell and then sum them up, we will calculate each pass several times for like how many uh, orange cell it visited and that's not nice. And the second property is ruined because it is possible to visit uh, the forbidden zone still. Like this. It is probably still possible to like, relatively easily calculate the number of valid ways to choose the first half, uh, but ruining the first property makes this an absolutely unusable set. Uh, and it is not uh, surprising that this diagonal set uh, is very useful because uh, those diagonals are generally useful in these problems where uh, we are working with paths that goes uh, go right and down. Uh, look at the slower picture now. Uh, every valid pass, every pass that goes right or down. Uh, on each step it moves to the next diagonal. So for every diagonal uh, exactly one cell on that diagonal will be visited and they will be visited in order. So for example for the pink diagonal we know that uh, exactly one of the cells on this diagonal will be visited exactly as the third cell. So we can go like this and get the third cell, we can go like this, like this, like this. It always will be the third cell on the pass. And that's nice. That's it for episode one. Thanks for watching.